Hi guys, and welcome to Mama Loves Mysteries and Tea. It's Sinister Saturdays, and I'm Laura. I have a great one for you guys today. This is one I literally grew up with in my backyard. It was a 10 minute walk, if that. Two minute drive, if that, from my house. So I guess this is like local first-hand knowledge for this one. You ready? All right, let's get started. Sinister Saturday's case this week is Ronald William Steele, a.k.a. the Karate Killer. Yep, not the Karate Kid, the Karate Killer. Now, this all started June 21st, 1985. Actually, it started off in a shopping center, Millcraft Shopping Center. Lucille Horner, 88, Sarah Kuntz, 85, Minnie Warwick, 86, were all there for a luncheon for their club. It was supposed to be a beautiful day, nothing out of the unordinary, just a ladies' day out with friends. That's it. Little did they know, Mr. Steele was outside, lurking in the parking lot. A neighbor in an apartment right next to the shopping center Mrs. Stiller actually saw it. She saw him wandering the parking lot looking for something. Now, he really didn't raise too many red flags because Mr. Still was wearing a three-piece gray suit. He was a clean-cut, handsome-looking African-American male. He didn't raise any red flags at all. Although it was odd he was roaming a parking lot. The odd part of this, that Mr. St Mrs. Stiller, 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 it's a little tricky there, guys, said was, when she saw Mrs. Horner walk towards the parking lot, Mr. Steele made a beeline right to, to her. He proceeded to look at her tire and speak with her, probably telling her there was a nail in her tire or something looked off or maybe somebody was playing with it. It was concerning enough that Mrs. Horner got out of her car, inspected the tire with him, and then proceeded to walk to the passenger side of her car while Mr. Steele got into the driver's side of the car. Mm -hmm. It was that easy. From there, they drove up to the entryway and picked up Sarah and Millie. And that was the last time these three beautiful elderly ladies were ever seen again. Just like that. Now, Later that same day, between 3 and 3.30, Mr. Steele pulled into Clemens Service and Gas Station in Hendersonville. Hendersonville actually is butt up right against the road I lived on. I grew up on Cecil Henderson Road. So it was a hop, skip, jumping away. In fact, Clemens Gas Station, we used to go there all the time as kids. He sold penny candy all the way up into the early 2000s. So yeah, we stopped down there a lot, especially in the summer. It was a nice place, very friendly, family owned, always had been. Mr. Steele, however, was there for gas and it was a quick in and out before he pulled out and went towards the right, towards Hendersonville. Nothing unusual, that's pretty normal. But an hour later though, he returned coming from the opposite direction, from Cannonsburg. But he wasn't driving the car, he was just coasting it down the hill to Clemens Service Center again. Apparently the car had stalled on him. So while Clemens' son was fixing the car and getting it running, Mr. Steele came in, bought two pops, chit-chatted a little bit, and proceeded to give a local boy who was there, probably getting candy, a gold chain. It was later found out that this gold chain actually belonged to Minnie Warwick. So by this time, Whatever awful act he did had already been done. Now, there's also something else that happened between this little time frame here. Danelle Warisick proceeded to go home and find out that her house had been robbed. Yep, robbed. Her house was right up the hill from Clemens' gas station. So, yeah. But that wasn't like 
totally unusual. I mean, it was. Not a lot of crime happened in that area, I can tell you for a fact, for a very, very long time. It was a pretty well quiet little town. It still is. But uh, what she noticed was there was a uh, weird piece of cloth left at her house that didn't belong to her. And uh, she really wasn't sure where it came from. That later turned out to be a piece of Minnie's dress. I don't know why it was there. I don't know if he had taken it. Maybe he had wrapped the gold chain in it and it fell out of his pocket. Who knows? But now we have Mr. Steele, who had clearly picking up these three elderly ladies. He's visited this gas station twice in the day, and now someone's home has come up rubbed. Unfortunately, it wasn't until the next day, June 22nd, that our ladies were found. A friend of theirs had uh, found Lucille Horner deceased. It wasn't until later on that day that Sarah Kuntz and Minnie Warwick were found. Their bodies underneath a pile of tires left there to be forgotten about. Now, this is a small town. A coroner was called out and the autopsy was performed that day in urgency. And this is what we found out. And he actually testified to this during Mr. Steele's trial. These victims had died from trauma. They were covered in bruises from their necks to their face to their chest and abdomen, their arms. They had broken bones. There were no particles left behind or nothing to show that it was an object. So the final ruling was it was by somebody's hand. Lucille's liver had been shattered inside of her body. Okay. Sarah's windpipe was crushed so severely that it suffocated her. Which probably saved her from the awful pain of having her heart detached from itself. She was hit so hard, her heart detached from the inside. Guys, this is awful. I literally had to stop reading the autopsy report. I was flabbergasted by this. I didn't know that you could hit somebody that hard with your hand. Well, it turns out Mr. Steele was a martial art instructor and a black belt. I don't know what level, but he was a black belt. He had taught classes. And the final conclusion with that information put involved is that he quite literally karate chopped them to death. He beat them so hard, part of their insides exploded and shattered. Now, the only thing that actually made him get caught, that threw this, his name into the pool, well, not only the fact that he was driving Mrs. Horner's car around the whole time, it was the fact that he was caught with all these stolen things from Mrs. Horner and Mrs. Kuntz to Mrs. Wansnick, who had her house robbed. Now, Mrs. Horner's things and Mrs. Kuntz's things were actually found at his mother's residence. She lived in a living home facility. So while someone was there cleaning, they noticed a, a white purse that, you know, maybe hadn't been sitting around or not seen before. And they looked into it and found all kinds of stolen items and Mrs. Horner's credit card and uh, Mrs. Kuntz's credit card. This is in a separate area altogether. These objects were found. Mr. Steele was seen removing stolen items from Mrs. Horner's trunk at his girlfriend's house. Seen with these items. Again, he's still driving Mrs. Horner's car. Now, the final witness during his trial I found to be very interesting. Her name was Sarah Hare. And a few days before all this happened, she was in Bridgeville. 
Bridgeville's about mm, eight miles, six miles, ten miles from Cecil. Cecil is butt up against Hendersonville. I need to go from there. She had been out shopping that day and she was getting into her car when none other than Mr. Steele approached her. He said, hey, I seen somebody messing with your car. A couple kids were over here playing with your tires. I'm a little worried about you driving them. And he was very persistent that he should allow her to allow him to drive her car somewhere to get this tire looked at. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Hare got out of her car, looked herself, didn't see anything, got back into her car. No, but, you know, oddly enough, when Mr. Steele looked, he came up with a pair of scissors. Scissors she hadn't seen when she looked, but he had them. Red flags everywhere. Mrs. Hare said, no, no, no. I will take care of this myself, thank you. And she drove away. And thank goodness she did. Because, well, again, only a few few days later, we lost those three beautiful elderly ladies. Now, I'd also like to point out that during the trial, one of Mr. Steele's appeals was this, that they had found that this case, these murderers were obviously done by a psychopath but they had not proven that he himself was a psychopath and only a psychopath could have done this. He was not. He literally said this in court, I am not a psychopath. Of course, a jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. He was to die in 2009. However, he is being resentenced. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because, well, yes, he was driving Mrs. Horner's car and he he was found with Mrs. Warwick's necklace but he squares up and down this is a mistaken identity he didn't do this he's not a psychopath he could never do anything this horrendous that maybe the state police planted evidence on him kind of outlandish but not really all that outlandish I guess I'd like to point out too that during his lifespan at age 17, he was actually awarded a hero's award. He saved a boy by driving his car on railroad tracks to get out and save a boy who had gotten stuck on these railroad tracks. He saved this boy's life as an oncoming train came. While in jail, he's been a pretty, uh, pretty good prisoner. He stopped a suicide. He's prevented fights. He's in a lot of programs to help rehabilitate other inmates. Because again, he's not a psychopath. So, I guess, I don't know even know where to end with this. The reality of it is, here's my personal, with all these facts set aside, here is my personal opinion from reading all of this. I am not sure. I'll be honest. I'm not sure. I'm on the fence. While reading his resentencing, I found out that Minnie's hairs were found on a pair of gray trousers and a, or brown trousers, I'm sorry, and a brown jacket. But apparently... Again, he was wearing a gray three-piece suit that day. And he says he was in Pittsburgh that day. He wasn't even near it, of course. But the hair evidence is uh, its a little um, odd to me. Could have been cross-contamination? Of course, it happens all the time. That's not nothing new. It's a possibility. And my other thing that I can't help but haunt my own mind is this. I grew up in this area. In the 1980s, 1970s, and 1960s, this was a very small country town and very racist. I, I hate to say it, but it was. No excuse, of course. They were older generation. You know, kind of stuck in that weird hatred cycle there. But it was very racist. It's not now. By, by all means, it's not now. It's a very sweet town. But at that time, there were very few African-American families in the neighborhood. And the ones that were were very quiet and kept to themselves. Respected, but kept to themselves. So do I think it's possible that he could have been framed? Ah, it's always there. The possibility's there. Again, there's a lot of evidence that came into question. That's why this judge ordered for a resentencing. 
So clearly something didn't add up to this judge's eyes. So I'm on the fence. I don't know. I really don't. Who killed her? Who knows? But for now, Mr. Steele sits in jail. He was convicted of their crime, murdering Lucille Horner, Susan Kuntz, and me, Warwick. But again, I don't know. He had Mrs. Horner's car. He was caught with evidence. I don't know. But that's it for this week, guys. Thank you so much for watching this one. Um, if you want to look up more information about the Karate Killer, I got to tell you, it's, uh, it's kind of slim. It really is. I was hoping to have all kinds of information, but I really didn't. But by all means, go ahead. Find anything I didn't mention, please let me know in the comments below. I love getting, um, I love learning more. But again, thanks for watching. As always, watch your surroundings. Um, take care of yourself. Give a family member a call. Check in on them. Let them know you're okay. And um, I will see you guys next Saturday for all new Sinister Saturdays. Bye.